Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Yi Yao uh, from ISR International. And um, maybe just from the chat, uh, probably you guys have already known, and uh, we have quite a lot of students go to uh, ISR International for internships. And uh, ISR International is a very famous uh, company that is working with quite a lot with government and doing quite a lot of research, particularly on computer vision and, uh, and machine learning, those areas. Um, regarding Dr. Yi Yao, and, uh, um, uh, she is uh, currently a senior technical manager at the Center of uh, Vision Technology, ISRI International. From what I know, uh, ISRI International is um, have, has quite a lot of different groups working on computer vision, but Center for Vision Technology is the biggest computer vision group and working in the area of deep learning and computer vision. vision. And maybe later, if any of you guys are interested, you can apply for the internship in their company. Um, Dr. Yao has already significant experience in computer vision, machine learning, data um, mining, social uh, media, and um, visual surveillance, and object detection, event detection, tracking. And uh, she has more than 50 uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences, and 10, uh, more than 10 uh, granted patents. And uh, Dr. Yao is a PI and uh, works as a PI and co-PI for multiple DAPA projects and also uh, NGA uh, project. For example, ship, ship detection, multi-model, uh, small ship detection uh, from satellite imagery and, um, and uh, in-situ computer, uh, in-situ continue learning with streaming data and noisy, with noisy annotation. And uh, she has already been working on some other uh, funded project for IPRA and uh, NGA and, um, and Coastal. And uh, she is also a um, technical advisor for DAPA, multiple DAPA project. Um, also, Dr. Yao is uh, graduated from uh, University of Tennessee and, uh, and in, I think, multiple years, many years ago. And not, 2008. Not ago. 2008, okay. And after that, she has worked in uh, GE International, G, GE company, uh, General, uh, uh, General Electronics, and for four or five years. And after that, she go, went to SRI, right now is the manager there. And uh, okay, um, her talk today is about um, classification and calibration in low data um, regime. Uh, I believe quite a lot of students work on remote sensing and and work on computer vision, all of you guys will need to do kind of a classification and the camera calibration. Even for those guys who work on satellite images, calibration is a very big thing. And almost the calibration is the first thing you need to do if you want to work on cameras and computer visions. Okay, I think that could be quite a lot of interesting things in Dr. Yao's talk. And now I want to hand um, the talk to handle the, the, the talking time to, to Dr. Yao for, for, the, for the continuous excellent talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Yao. Thank you Guiyue, for the introduction. And also thank you for the opportunity for me to talk about our work here. It's my, really my pressure, a pleasure. So actually, by the way, I have two monitors here. So if I'm facing the camera, that means I'm looking at my slide. If I'm facing this way, that means I'm looking uh, at the audience if I were talking to you. So I will switch uh, in between throughout my talk. So uh, today I will talk about uh, our recent work for classification and calibration in low data regimes. Uh, so maybe first I will give a introduction of SIR. So, and our uh, CVT Center for Vision Technologies. So SI is a nonprofit uh, research institute. Uh, we have about 2000 staff members and about 20 locations worldwide. So SI has pioneered many technologies. So uh, some of them are highlighted here, uh, maybe notably the first computer mouse uh, and the latest is the Siri for uh, as personal assistant on iPhones. So uh, for our CVT, we have about 90 
uh, staff members and half of which uh, do have PhD degrees. And we also have 40 years of history in real-time computer vision and recently machine learning. So here I also have some highlights. Uh, for example, the first real-time uh, augmented reality uh, for the sports uh, broadcasting uh, like the uh, live TV in 1994. So I also listed some recent ongoing projects within CVT. Uh, this is just to give you a very quick glance of what we do here. So we, we have many three bucket here. Uh, the most of the work is uh, supported by the government, for example, ARPA, uh, DAPA, uh, ONR, and some downstream agencies, including NGA, CTDSO, as such. We also have some commercial projects supported by different uh, companies uh, who are interested in our technologies, for example, Toyota. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the Olympics this year, but Actually, as planned, the, uh, the, uh, the Toyota concept car for the Olympics will have our technologies on it. Uh, and we also have this, what we call the IRAD, that is the internal investment projects. We use these IRADs to develop some uh, cutting edge techniques that we think are critical for our further development. So this is a very quick introduction of SIR as well as our Center for Vision Technologies. This is just for your information here. So uh, the first uh, part of my talk will focus on classification in low data regimes. So this is actually a few short learning. So we want to uh, train deep neural networks using limited uh, uh, labeled data. So this is very important for practical applications. Uh, for example, uh, for medical imaging processing, the annotations are expensive to obtain uh, since uh, domain knowledge is required to annotate data. In some scenarios, the annotations are even harder to obtain. For example, complex entity detection from satellite imagery, uh, the combinatorial explosion makes it very difficult to uh, annotate every combination possible. So for although few shots learning has been a top a very popular topic for quite some time it still faces uh, some like long-standing uh, challenges. I listed two here. Uh, first, uh, there exist large semantic gaps between the seen and unseen classes. Uh, and second, for the novel or the unseen classes, the label data is very sparse, only one shot or five shots. And this label data is frequently uniformly, non-uniformly distributed. To address the first uh, challenge, the representation learning seems to be an effective way. So on the representation learning, we still see two lines of work. The first, uh, just use self-supervision where uh, proxy tasks are constructed to leverage the uh, characteristics from the data to learn richer representations. And the second line of work, uh, just impose more regularization on top of the learning so that the features are more robust. For the second challenge, transducting uh, inference is introduced to uh, leverage unlabeled data in order to fill in the bl uh, blank or empty space left by the labeled data. Uh, for transducting inference, we also see two types, broadly two types of techniques, including super uh, uh, pseudo labeling and knowledge distillation. Uh, to address the first challenge, we uh, develop what we call the hybrid consistency training. So this is a reg uh, regularization-based representation uh, learning met method. We leverage both interpolation 
and data augmentation consistencies so that our features are uh, richer and more robust at the same time. So these are all good for uh, generalization capa uh, capacity. So for the second challenge, we develop what we call calibrated iterative prototype adaptation. So uh, SIPA. The SIPA is actually a prototype-based transductive inference method. We first calibrate or normalize the features uh, to compensate for the, any uh, possible shift, distribution shift from episode to episode. We then iteratively update the prototypes using unlabeled data. In this way, hopefully we can have more robust prediction. Here I show some uh, different levels of local consistency here. In the very close neighborhood of a sample, we introduce the adversarial perturbation uh, to the original example, uh, epsilon. By adding epsilon, we still requiring uh, the output to be consistent to maintain the same labels. At the second level, we introduce more local variations by augmenting the data. Here we include both weakly augmented and uh, strongly augmented samples. So uh, going beyond the neighborhood of a specific uh, example, we look into the uh, spaces between examples. We impose the linear behavior on the uh, interpolation of two uh, examples. So this is what we call mix up uh, variation or the inter interpolation uh, consistency. As I mentioned uh, before, we try to combine the interpolation consistency and the data augmentation consistency. But instead of just adding these two consistency losses together in a uh, somewhat post hoc manner, we actually impose the interpolation consistency on top of the uh, augmented samples directly. So these samples including weakly and strongly augmented samples. So on the right, we show uh, some notional plot here. So compared to the mix up, uh, straightforward mix up consistency, where they only uh, impose the uh, linear behavior uh, cross samples, actually our uh, HCT training can consider impose the linear behavior in a wider extent, including the strongly uh, augmented data. So by introducing more variations, the, uh, it is potentially, uh, we can learn more richer uh, features and by imposing the linear behavior in a wider extent, uh, we can regularize the learning better. So the learned features will be more robust. Uh, furthermore, we encourage linear behavior of model input with respect to not only the input, but also the intermediate or the hidden features of the, uh, throughout the whole network. So in doing so, we can have smoother uh, manifold throughout the whole network. So with richer and more robust features and smoother manifolds, these are all good for uh, improving few shot learning performances. So for the uh, iterative uh, prototype adaptation, as I said, we first uh, normalize the features to compensate for distribution variations from episode to episode. Uh, on the right hand side, I showed the uh, pseudo pseudo code here. So uh, to normalize the features, we have a uh, power uh, transformation. We subject the mean from the features. We also do F2 uh, normalization. After that, we uh, iteratively update the prototypes using unlabeled data. So there are also some uh, works uh, using iterative uh, update method uh, for example, I listed the work from Hu et al. That's the most recent work here. So they actually use the sinkhole mapping 
to find the best uh, distribution match, which is more complex than our method. In our method, we only use the simple uh, cosine similarity. Uh, furthermore, their method uh, assumes that the test sets uh, has an equal number of examples for uh, different cl classes, uh, which is not uh, in kind of require the data set to be class balanced, but we don't have such uh, assumption and can be applied to uh, data with uh, class imbalance. This is more practical for uh, real world applications. We test our algorithms on the two settings. The first is the uh, standard few shot learning setting. We used five popular data sets, uh, four of which are uh, for generic object categories, including mini image net, tiered image net, self FS and FC. Uh, 100. So FC100 is actually derived, uh, both sci-fi FS and FC100 are derived from the sci-fi data. Uh, we also use a fine, uh, one data set with fine-grained categories, the CU birds data set. Uh, the second setting is a more challenging uh, setting, it's cross-domain field short learning. Here we have both uh, label shift and data shift. We train our model on mini Im image net and test the performance on the CUB data set. So on the bottom, I also list the number of classes, how the class are uh, split between train, well, and testing, uh, number of images per class, as well as the image size we used to train our network. First, uh, I will talk about some of the ablation studies. Uh, the first set of ablation studies for the uh, hybrid consistency training. We list uh, some of uh, the, the loss losses we use here, including the supervised cross entropy loss. That's the first loss, first column here. And the manifold mix up, the second column, and our HCT loss. Uh, we also uh, add the uh, self-supervision in a multi-task multi uh, learning setting. Uh, we use the rotation as an example uh, loss here. So uh, with that, the, if we consider row-wise, we, we are considering uh, different uh, uh, embedding learning methods with different losses or combinations of the losses. We also test our algorithms with different inference methods, including our pro proposed SIPA, uh, as well as the classic uh, prototypical networks and its uh, semi-supervised version, the semi-protonet. Uh, if we can Pair the performance column-wise, we can see that our SIPA, the iterative updating method, can produce uh, the best performance overall for most of the uh, experiments. When we compare our uh, HCT loss with respect to the uh, supervised uh, uh, cross-entropy loss, adding the HCT loss actually leads to a uh, about uh, two to three percent improvement on image net, mini image net. So for CUB net, when uh, protonet or semi protonet is used, are used as the inference method, we did not see obvious improvement. But when we use our SIPA inference, we uh, still see about two percent uh, improvement. Next, we compare our HCT loss with respect to the man manifold mix-up loss. So this is to compare whether uh, imposing the linear behavior in a wider extent uh, is beneficial or not. Uh, comparing row, the second and the third row for mini image net, as well as for the COB data set, 
we see that the performance uh, are similar, but our uh, HCT gives a slightly better performance for one shot. By adding the uh, rotation-based self-supervised loss, we see a little bit different trends here. The performances are still similar for mini image net, but we see a, a big uh, improvement on COB. The improvement is about three to five percent here. This also shows that our uh, HCT does bring in some benefit, especially for more challenging data sets such as the COB data set. Next, we look into the ablation study for the iterative uh, transductive uh, inference. Uh, in this table, we have two parts. Uh, the top half, we look into uh, different steps for the future normalization or future calibration. And the bottom, uh, we show different parameters uh, for uh, updating the prototypes, including uh, the, uh, the weights when we update the prototype and the number of iterations. So by subtracting the mean from all the features, we already see about 3% improvement. The power transform introduces another 2% improvement. Uh, as expected, the most improvement uh, is achieved by adding the iterative updating. We see about 7% improvement on one shot and 3% improvement on five, sh five shots. By changing the parameters, the performance is uh, also vary, especially for the one shot scenario. After the ablation study, we compare the performance of, of our method with the state, other state of the art method published in literature. Uh, this is the performance for five way one shot. Uh, we use ResNet 12 as our back, backbone. Uh, architecture, but we also compare our performances with uh, networks uh, with deeper uh, deeper backbone, including DanceNet and the uh, WRN. So here the bolded numbers are the, the best number uh, reported in literature. The green means uh, we have the best uh, performance. Oh, the bottom two are the, our methods. And I forgot to mention that our embedding learning method can be applied in two modes. First, it can be used as absolutic meta training. It can be also used as uh, in a batch mode for pre-training. So th that's why we have two uh, uh, rows of numbers here. So the green number means we have the best performance in literature, uh, and the orange means we have comparable performance. So for five, so for five way one shot, we achieve the best performance for three data sets out of five uh, data sets we did experiment on. Uh, we have uh, comparable performance for one data set. This is the comparison for five way five shots. Still, we use ResNet 12 as our backbone. Uh, here we see that we have the best performance on the COB dataset and the comparable performance for the SAFA uh, FS dataset. Finally, this is the performance for uh, cross domain field shot learning. Uh, Again, we train our model on mini image net uh, and test it on the COB dataset. Uh, so for this uh, experimental setting, uh, there are fewer reported performances in the literature. So comparing to the Laplace shot, which is the which was the best uh, for one shot, uh, we achieve about seven percent improvement uh, for one shot. Uh, comparing to the S2M2R, uh, we achieved about 4% uh, improvement for uh, five shots. So with all these experiments, we can, uh, 
can see that our method is a strong contender here, especially for one shot and the performance on the COB dataset, which is a more uh, challenging dataset, a fine-grained category uh, dataset. Uh, to summarize the first part of my talk, uh, we look into the two uh, challenges for few shot learning, uh, including the large semantic gaps between the seen and, and unseen classes, and the second challenge that is for the uh, novel classes or unseen classes, the label data uh, is sparse and non uniformly distributed. For the first challenge, we introduce this hybrid consist consistency training to leverage both interpolation and data augmentation consistency uh, to learn uh, rich and uh, robust features to bridge the gap, the semantic gaps. For the second challenge, we introduce this uh, calibrated iterative prototype adaptation so that we normalize the features uh, as well as iteratively update the prototypes to fill in the empty spaces uh, between the label data. So we also show uh, that our method can achieve the state the art performance for both uh, standard field shot learning uh, as well as the uh, cross domain field shot learning. Uh, so with that, I will switch to the second uh, topic that's calibration in low data regime. Uh, so here the calibration means the calibrating the neural networks. Uh, before that, uh, I'm kind of, if you have immediate question for the first topic, uh, please feel free to stop me. Um, I think later, uh, if you have, if any of you have quick questions, uh, please raise right now. Uh, if you, if later, uh, otherwise you can also ask the Dr. Yafu at the end of the talk. Okay, probably um, I will just yeah. first. Or anybody, if, if you, you don't, you, you feel shy or to speak, you can also leave messages on the chat box and I will read your, your questions later. I think we can go okay. keep going. Okay. Thank you. So for calibration, uh, this is for the problem where uh, we see that the outputs, the confidence scores outputs by the neural networks are not indicative of the true probability of correct classification. Uh, here, uh, I borrowed the illustration from the uh, Guo's uh, work. Uh, so on the bottom, we see that here's the perfectly calibrated uh, scenario where the confidence uh, indicates the uh, probability of correct uh, classification or the accuracy perfectly. But the neural networks usually output this type of uh, uh, confidence scores where the confidence score is high, for example, at 80, 0 0.8, but the uh, accuracy is actually is lower than uh, 80%. So that's why we see this uh, red shaded area uh, as the gap between the uh, actual output and the calibrated output. So calibration is then introduced to address such problem. Uh, so usually we use a small data set of label data to normalize the confidence scores with respect to the true probability. Uh, here I list uh, some of the popular methods, including metric scaling, vector scaling, and temperature scaling, and their variants to address the bias. Uh, although they already show some successful applications, uh, but we are kind of asking a harder question. That is, given limited access to target data, how to perform calibration? So actually, we started to see uh, publications on 
uh, this topic uh, on a, uh, from this year. We listed uh, three of the works we see in li literature uh, on the bottom. All three of the works actually follow domain adaptation uh, type of approach to do the calibration transfer. Uh, they still need unlabeled data from the target domain, uh, which may not even be available at the stage of uh, calibration for real world applications. And also their accuracy, the accuracy for uh, calibration transfer depends heavily on the alignment between the source and the target domains. I will show some example later. So to address these two uh, challenges, we uh, developed this calibration transfer uh, using domain, uh, domain generalization. In this way, we don't need any data from the target domain at the stage of class classifier training and calibration. Uh, at the same time, we leverage multiple domains to optimize the alignment between the target and the calibration domains. In this way, we can improve the calibration transfer. Uh, so here, I just il illustrate how we do the classification training, uh, calibration and testing. Since we have multiple uh, domains, we use some of the domain to train the classifier. The another set of the domains to uh, calibrate the uh, classifier and test its performance on the holdout uh, target domain. We introduced uh, two types of methods for calibration transfer through domain generalization. We refer to them as the uh, set level and the class level. Uh, at the set level, we actually just learn uh, temperature scaling using all of the data from the calibration domains. Uh, at cluster level, we first group the data from uh, calibration domains into uh, multiple clusters. We then learn temperature scaling for each cluster. Uh, given a test example, we select the cluster that is closest to the test example and use the temperature learned for that cluster to directly uh, calibrate the target example. So although our method seems uh, uh, simple or straightforward, uh, we will show th uh, their effectiveness through our experimental results. Uh, before that, we also look into some math to justify the, uh, our algorithm design. So here is the expected uh, error uh, given the true target distribution. So the error actually expected error uh, boils down to the ratio between the uh, joint distribution uh, between the uh, target and calibration domains. Uh, if only a label shift is considered, this further reduces to the uh, ratio between the conditional uh, uh, distributions. If only the covariant shift is considered, which is the case we are uh, dealing with, the uh, error is reduces to the mm. ratio between the data distributions or the uh, density ratio. So this is the scenario we are looking into. We are looking into the uh, uh, data set with only uh, covariant shift. So uh, now we compare our methods and the uh, method using uh, domain adaptation for uh, uh, calibration transfer. Uh, we will show that our method can uh, better align the target and calibration uh, domains uh, so that we have a smaller variance in the density ratio. And finally, that will give us a better uh, calibration transfer. So for calibration through domain adaptation, we have source domain here and target domain. Uh, and there may be a disparity between the distributions. Adding, using more uh, domains for calibration, even at only at the set level where we consider all the 
uh, calibration domains as one group. We already see that the uh, overlap between the uh, uh, data distribution of the calibration domains and the target domains, uh, the overlap uh, has been uh, improved already. So at the cluster level, actually we group the uh, classification domains into different clusters. For example, we have three clusters here. And uh, accordingly, we have three distributions here. And given a test example, we selected the one that is most closest, uh, uh, the closest to the test example. Say here, the third cluster is uh, selected. We can see uh, that the alignment is further improved. So this is only a, a simple illustration to show that our method can indeed improve the alignment between the target and calibration uh, uh, domains and therefore a better calibration transfer. Next, uh, I will show uh, our uh, uh, experimental results. We used two data sets, the office home data set and the domain net data set. Uh, so this is the office home data set. It has four domains, clip art, art, product, and real. And for each domain, uh, or for all of the domain, we have uh, 65 categories. So here we show some uh, example images from different domains and the number of uh, images per domain. Uh, this table summarizes our main results. We use the um, uh, expected uh, calibration error as the metric. We uh, use one domain to train our classifier and two domains to calibrate the classifiers. Uh, and the last domain to test the performance. So the each column co corresponding to different target uh, domain we average the performance over different splits with different source and calibration domains. And the last column is the another average across different target domains. Uh, we, uh, the bottom two rows show uh, our, our method, the performance of our methods. We compare uh, the performance of our methods with uh, like another two groups of methods. Uh, the first group is what we call the reference group. Uh, actually, we have the performance uh, without any calibration and the performance for source and target only calibration. For source only calibration, we train the network in the source domain and also calibrate the network in the source domain, uh, but test directly on the test uh, target domain. So in this experiment, actually, we don't have any calibration transfer. Uh, that's why it is, uh, can be considered as the uh, upper bound of the calibration error. For the target only calibration, we train the classifier in the source domain, but calibrate it in the target domain directly. So this is an ideal case. That's why uh, the performance here can, can be considered as the lower bound of the errors. So the second group is the baseline methods we compare our performance against. These are the two methods uh, for uh, calibration transfer uh, through domain adaptation. Uh, again, the bolded numbers are the best uh, performed uh, methods. Uh, from the four domains, we see that we achieve a uh, lower calibration error uh, uh, on three domains and also low calibration error on average when we consider, when we consider all four domains. So uh, here we have the bar chart to compare the average uh, uh, calibration errors for different uh, methods. Uh, these are again the upper bound of the error, source only calibration and the lower bound of the error, the target only calibration. And these two are our methods and these two are the method for calibration transfer through domain adaptation. And it is obvious that our method 
uh, produce lower uh, calibration errors. We further look into the behavior of the calibration errors with respect to different domains. Uh, here we arrange the, dom dom the domains uh, based on the image uh, real, uh, realism. So for the real domain, the, as the name suggested, the images are the most realistic. And for the clip art domain, the images are uh, the most abstract. So we see here actually the domains uh, um, uh, at the middle of the spectrum uh, give us lower uh, calibration errors, while the domains at the end of the spectrum, for example, the real and clip art, uh, they have higher uh, calibration errors. So this also uh, agrees with our uh, theoretical analysis. Uh, since better calibration transfer requires uh, better aligned uh, calibration and target uh, domains. Uh, so for the domains on the uh, both ends of the spectrum, uh, chances are lower for them to find better aligned uh, calibration domains. So that's why we saw uh, these higher calibration errors. So next set of uh, experiments, we use the domain net. So the uh, domain net is a more, uh, a bigger uh, data set. It has uh, six domains, clip arts, infograph, painting, quick draw, real, and sketch. Uh, it also has uh, more categories, about uh, more than uh, three, uh, 300 categories. So here we also show some example images uh, and the number of images for different domains uh, and different uh, train and test uh, split. Uh, again, we use the expected uh, calibration error as our uh, metric uh, and also each uh, column corresponding to different uh, target uh, domain. Uh, since we have do all, uh, more domains, we used uh, two of the, do the six domains for uh, training the classifier and the three of the domains for calibrating uh, and one domain for testing. Again, we average the performance uh, as the last column. Uh, but uh, so in literature, although we saw some numbers reported for domain net, but they did not evaluate the performance for all kinds of, all uh, uh, combinations of different domains. That's why we only compare our methods with the reference group, that is the uh, source only calibration as the upper bound, uh, target only calibration as the lower bound. Again, we showed the bar chart for the averaged uh, uh, ECE here. Mm. Again, the source only is the upper bound, target only is the lower bound. We see that compared to the uh, error upper bound, uh, we achieve about 7% uh, improvement, uh, or I should say reduction in the error. Again, we, sh we lay the domains based on their abstraction level uh, from the uh, uh, real to the quick draw. Again, we, we see this U-shape like behavior uh, where the domains uh, at the middle of the spectrum uh, have lower ECE errors while the domains on the, uh, at the end of the both ends of the spectrum uh, suffer from higher uh, calibration errors. Uh, finally, uh, we also uh, define what we call the improvement ratio because we want to compare uh, across different algorithms as well as across different data sets. Since uh, I mentioned several times, we uh, use the source only calibration as the upper bound and the tar target calibration uh, as the lower bound, we leverage these two to define this improvement ratio. 
the numerator of the improvement ratio is uh, the difference between the performance of a, a calibration transfer method with respect to the source only calibration, the upper bound. That is how much improvement is gained from calibration transfer. And the denominator is the differences between the lower bound and the upper bound. That is the best improvement you can achieve uh, by introducing calibration transfer. Uh, so with that, the improvement ratio uh, is nicely uh, between zero and one, and the higher, the better. Uh, on the bottom, we show where different methods locate uh, with respect to the uh, improvement ratio. So for these are the two methods uh, for trans uh, uh, calibration transfer using domain adaptation. The weighted uh, te uh, temperature scaling, actually uh, the performance is very similar to source only calibration, not too much improvement. Uh, the transcale uh, produces a better improvement. It can compensate about one fifth of the error. These two are our methods. One is on the office home dataset and the other is on the uh, domain data dataset. For both of the uh, datasets, we can compensate for more than half of the uh, calibration error errors uh, by introducing calibration transfer. So this clearly shows the uh, improvement from our methods. To summarize the second half, so uh, we uh, look into the problem for calibration, but with very limited access to target data. In literature, we only see three methods uh, proposed this year. Uh, they, they all uh, fall in the category of using domain adaptation for calibration transfer. They need unlabeled data uh, from target domain for uh, calibration transfer. And also their performance depends heavily on the alignment between the source and target domains. To address these two limitations, we introduce this uh, calibration transfer through domain generalization. Uh, in this way, we don't need any data from the target domain uh, in the stage of uh, either training or calibration. We also leverage multiple uh, domains uh, so that we can better align the calibration and the target domains for improved uh, calibration transfer. We showed the improvement from our method on two data sets, uh, the office home and the domain net data sets. I think with that, uh, I will conclude my talk here. Uh, before uh, I switch to any questions, so I want to thank my team uh, Dr. Meng Ye, he did most of the work on the few short learning, and Dr. Yinye Gong, she did most of the work for uh, calibration, uh, neural network calibration. Uh, and also Dr. Gijus, Xiao, and Ajay for their uh, input. Uh, so with that, I will thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your great talk. And uh, right now, uh, do any of you have questions? Actually, I want to I, I want to first apologize for the for the <laughs> misunderstanding. Actually, and uh, I initially when I see the calib calibration, I directly think about uh, is cali camera calibration. Camera. But, but later I realized, well, this is not. This is more about uh, your network feature cal. And uh, and uh, I want to first apologize for that. No and um, <laughs> uh, I want to start with some questions. And you mentioned in the calibration part. Let's first talk calibration because I made a mistake there. <laughs> and uh, and um, you are using the clustering method. And uh, and I noticed uh, you you write down. Uh, N -N, I assume that is nearest neighbor. You are you are mentioned you 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 are writing N -N, that yes. means nearest neighbor, right? Yes. And um, and is the uh, nearest neighbor uh, the 
the only one you tried or you have tested multiple different clustering methods and uh, and select this one as is the best uh, so for yeah for clustering we actually just use k means and the nearest neighbor this is just referring to uh, how we choose the given the test set how we choose the uh, cluster so we choose the cluster based on the nearest neighbor Okay. But again, uh, for the clustering uh, method, we uh, tried the k-means and the hierarchical uh, clustering. Uh, we also, uh, maybe I should show this one. We also tried mm, to use different number of uh, clusters. Uh, so I think for the office home data set, since uh, when we do the calibration, we have two domains we use like uh, four to eight clusters. Then for the uh, domain net, we have more uh, domains, three domains. We choose a little bit higher number of clusters. So with these variations, the performance for the calibration transfer actually is very similar. So that's why we just use a simple clustering method here and also just use a fixed number of clusters. Yeah, and um, and for uh, for the class uh, for the clustering, um, is it in the feature level or is uh, in the in the raw image level? Uh, at the feature level, at yeah. Feature As level. you can see here, we have a pre-trained ResNet eighteen. We cluster the uh, uh, features to get the different groups. So it's at the feature level, and also because. Given a test sample, we just use the features to choose the uh, closest cluster. So to transfer the calibration parameters. Um, also, um, Stu, um, for, the, for the performance, and I noticed you also emphasized uh, a couple of times and um, for more abstract of the scene for the, uh, in the, in, in, and it's somehow in the middle, there is something like that is the, that is the, the, the area is the smallest, but is more abstract that, that is becoming areas higher. Um, do you have some uh, insight? Why could this happen? So I think uh, in previously we, we see here, the, if we have more overlap, then we will have better uh, calibration transfer. So then when we look at this, because the uh, we lay out this based on the abstraction. So this is more real, this is more abstract. So for domains within, uh, chances are higher to have a better aligned uh, distribution between the calibration and the target domain. So that's why we see smaller errors here. But for the mm, domains at the both ends, since you don't have another domain lay here, so chances of alignment is smaller. Uh, so that's why we see this U-shape behavior. Yeah, that is actually my another question about about the data and uh, and um, and the, you compare with the domain domain uh, adaptation in another two work, and I I kind of thinking is this is this somehow has some. Uh, particularly uh, good performance as on some kind of a data. For example, uh, whether the target data is is more or target data if, if the target data is not is not that much. And maybe in the in the if you I know you target at the the, the, um, the problem, there's not much target data, very few and uh, and uh, and uh, whether this is the best situation. For example, if you, you have quite a lot of target data suddenly, and whether the, dom the domain, uh, domain net, domain adaption, uh, the two works you mentioned, two, three works you mentioned, could could perform slightly better in, the, in, in that case. Uh, yes, actually, that's kind of some of the experiments uh, we are doing uh, right now, uh, because here we, uh, in the table here, we only uh, listed the reported uh, uh, numbers from the papers. We do want to look into more uh, what's the standard deviation of these numbers and how it is affected by the number of uh, like unlabeled data you used to 
uh, get the calibration. Uh, so these are the kind of some ablation studies we are doing right now to uh, because we actually need to implement their methods uh, to get more insights because in the original paper, those are not uh, reported. Um, back to the first the paper and the, and the, for the for the iterative method, uh, I assume uh, iterative method could be could get better better performance, uh, but quite a lot of time um, they need longer training and uh, and somehow the, the somehow it is is more likely to get to a, when you train to get a lot into a local minimum and in the training neural network, but Quite a lot of time, they the training is could could be much longer. Uh, is it sh showing in your in, in your neural network as well? Um, so yeah, for the complexity, actually, I think this is also one advantage we want to claim because other papers, as we mentioned, they use sing sing hole mapping to do the alignment. So that's more complex. So, but in our method, we actually just use cosine to do the pseudo labeling, which is very efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this very quick uh, pseudo labeling, we don't see too much added complexity. And as also showing here, um, so we compare, so the N, here is the number of iterations we use to update the prototypes. So actually for, for five shots, you already do not see much improvement uh, from iterative uh, updating. But for one shot, we do see that adding more iterations, it gives us uh, some more boost in the performance. Right. So I will see, um, so it's like the iterative is more helpful for one shot when the data is really uh, sparse and even one shot you, you, you cannot see whether it's uniformly distributed but it's sparse and the, it can be at a totally unexpected uh, place with re respect to other unlabeled data. So that's where the iterative updating is giving us uh, the improvement. When you have five shots, when but usually it will be a little bit distributed. Whether it is uniform distributed with respect to the distribution, that's still a question. But when you have five, you already have enough information to propagate your pseudo labels. So that's even with one iteration, it's already give you good performance. Right, right. So here, yeah. And also mm, we, we kind of, uh, because we only do like one to 20, I think 20 is the maximum number we used. And we also uh, kind of have this balance uh, weight uh, to uh, gradually update the prototypes. So it's not letting the prototype to jump uh, drastically. So in this way, we can kind of avoid some of the overfitting yeah, yeah. Uh, problem. So uh, overall, we did not see the evidence for overfitting uh, here. Yeah, right, 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 right. Because when we have the, the smaller change in the later iterations, we could try to avoid jumping from one local movement yeah. into something like another one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so any other questions from the audience or you can leave the messages in the, in the, chatting, bo in the chatting box. Or if you are interested, we can kind of uh, have discussion uh, through emails. You can shoot me questions through emails as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, if there is no question, we can end up uh, with the talk. And like uh, Dr. Yao mentioned, if for some questions, and if you have some, we have the recorded video, and probably after uh, five days or week, and we will post the, the, the talk on the YouTube video. And at that time, if you have some point you didn't really get, and you are, you are, you are free to watch these videos and later send Dr. Yao an email to ask for some questions. 
And uh, I think this is also a good way, like Dr. Yao mentioned at the very beginning, they are, they are trying to search for, for, the, um, for the summer interns in, the two, in 2000, I think in 2021. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think this is a good way for interacting with Dr. Yao and his group and to see whether you have common interest. Okay, there is a one question actually. Uh, uh, Carl, Carl you need no. to mute him? Um, he, he can un unmute. Would, what, uh, he, he is asking, what do you mean by temperature scaling? Okay, so that's kind of a very typical or classic uh, calibration uh, method. It's, it's like the, we are adding the uh, temp temperature in the neck log likelihood so that we can scale the whole uh, confidence scores up and down to match the true uh, probability distribution. And he has a follow-up question. Is it something like used in knowledge uh, distillation? Um, distillation. No, I it's different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think uh, to, I think, Knowledge distillation is really trying to to use the something like a student network to 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 get the main thing in the in the teacher network, and yeah. uh, and for for temperature uh, scaling like Dr. Yao mentioned is mainly trying to do trying to scaling up to make a more uniform distribution. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, if no question, let's turn to Dr. Yao again and, um, and, uh, and end up the talk here. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you.